Run. And thank you, Jana, and thank you to Neil and Karen Stewart for inviting me on behalf of the Employers Network for Equality and Inclusion, or simply ENEI, as we prefer to be known. I should also at this time like to thank my colleagues Adrian Hyrelein and Trett, or as I like to call them, Adrian with too many Ys, and also my colleague Dion Eldridge, who have helped me put together this presentation this morning because I've had my head buried in a pillow for the last few days, recovering from a migraine. The Employers Network for Equality and Inclusion has been in existence since 2011. And we are, not, we are a not-for-profit organisation, membership-led, that provides support and guidance in taking our members from where they say they are diverse to being truly inclusive by providing consul consultancy, consultancy, training, and as, just as importantly, the opportunity to network with like-minded organisations to shift the inclusion initiative. But as well known as we are in the UK, as some of you may know, our chief exec, Denise Keating, and the ENEI board made the decision back in April 2018 that the ENEI brand that is so well known and recognised and intrinsically linked to the UK diversity and inclusion culture within many businesses and organisations would also benefit from expanding our delivery of this knowledge to cover that of a global culture. To enable us the best chance of success, we began this process by concentrating on the role of those members we had worked with at a corporate level and with those that we knew who had already had a global presence, including organisations such as PwC, EY and other instantly recognisable brands. This move empowered us to build up a really useful toolkit. We have called it our Knowledge Bank. With an in-depth analysis of nearly 60 countries, this toolkit provides our global members access to information on diversity and inclusion, legislation, cultural information, and in some cases, just as importantly, the lack of legislation and inclusive cultures embedded in those countries where we hold within our toolkit. This has been particularly useful for many of our global members when considering the setting up of a global office in a country where they have understood the challenges, but not necessarily the culture. The development of the ENI Global Membership Proposition to what is currently a growing 23 major worldwide organisations has meant that the emerging global trends around data monitoring and cultural intelligence have grown exponentially and our knowledge around this area has meant that new organisations joining us have the opportunity to attain the expertise quickly to help, to help their support and growth in terms of collecting data on diversity. I think we would all agree that there was once or perhaps still is a time whereby data monitoring was seen as just an annoying HR process, ignored by many and scoffed at by some senior managers as an organisation's box ticking exercise to be able to get into that process. Fast forward to 2019, and I think that most of us would agree that this is no longer the case. The business case for diversity and, more importantly, inclusion in the workplace is invaluable and all our organisations at a global level are scrambling to ensure their workplaces can be measured and informed on the various characteristics, but not just the protected characteristics. We need to move into unconscious bias territory. However, what will it take to be a leading global inclusive organisation in the future? In five years? 10 years, even 15 years. Say those numbers slightly differently as 2025, 2030, or 2035, and your imagination takes you someplace else entirely. The realm of science fiction, in which books and films paint vivid pictures of a future that looks vastly different from where we are today. There's the devastated world and its dystopian societies, the artificial world with synthetic humans, and myriads of other worlds scattered throughout foreign galaxies. In these books and films, there's always a get quest, and there's always a hero. Smart and strong, they carry the weight of the world on their shoulders. They have a sidekick, if lucky, but rarely as the leader, and the sidekick is never equal, and they almost never operate as a team. The decisions these leaders make, the actions they take, culminate in the restoration of humanity. What's curious is this iconic image of the heroic leader 
remains constantly despite the vast, vastly changed environment. It seems we can easily imagine different future contexts, but when it comes to thinking about leadership differently, we are on a repeating loop. It makes for a great entertainment, but it's not the stuff of reality. Yes, the context will change. It is changing already, and this will demand adaptation by those playing a leading role. The same can be said in this, the world of diversity and inclusion at a global level. The men's challenges for organisations to ensure that data is collected evenly, where there is legislation and laws which prevents the collection of data, for instance. Through our work with our global members, we know that in France, the collection of data on race and ethnicity is a real challenge, or in Germany, on age and disability, thereby creating global targets, quotas, is very difficult when only being able to ask certain questions. Of course, in some places around the world, being LGBT plus is not only not recognised, but illegal. And therefore, even in global organisations, people will be wary about disclosure of their sexual orientation or gender identity, especially in those countries where legislation means that it is illegal. However, the global trend is to ensure that data monitoring takes place. Later on this year, ENAI will be holding our first roundtable of all its global members to discuss the implications of monitoring and being given presentations on how different organisations have managed this exercise. An example of this, in context of the title or a case study, is at IBM. At IBM, data is combined with artificial intelligence and is used extensively by both the HR teams and managers with direct reporting instructions. The data is used to measure hiring, predicted attrition, talent management, compensation, skills, sentiment analysis, employee engagement surveys, and unconscious bias and diversity. The global HR system used by HR is Workday, and specifically in the UK employees are asked to voluntarily declare their ethnicity, sexual orientation, any disabilities, preferred pronouns, faith, particularly in Northern Ireland, a further enhancement of this is the capture of those individuals who are ex-service veterans or on a reserve list. This proved particularly useful for forward planning of staffing levels during the time of the 2012 Olympics, when planning coverage provided the predicted shortfall of staffing due to the call-up of reserves as required to be on duty at this time. Another example that the system allows for is in the terms of the questions related to each other country's laws such as in the United Arab Emirates or Saudi Arabia, where the sexual orientation question is removed from the online questionnaire through the flexibility of the workday system. Moving on to where I think we need to be, I want to pay homage to the wonderful Amir Kabel, the global head of DNI at Burberry, who wrote a wonderful article on LinkedIn at the beginning of this year that I personally feel reflects exactly the key findings that we at ENI have seen as this DNI trends that have been prevalent in our radar since the time this article was written. In fact, I would go further to say that if Amir was not a DNI professional, he should go and get his tarot reading cards because it was so exact. The first on Amir's list is to have more of a commitment of belonging. Let us be honest, most organisations know that it makes good sense to recognise the importance of diversity, but to be truly successful and to attract the best talent, it's not just about how much you will pay me, but how much you will your organisation make me feel valued and respected and want to stay. The second aspect, I have to quote Amir. Minimising guesswork and humans' biases is important to help achieve more diversity in companies. In job interviews or talent mapping, or even reconnecting with candidates from the past. Utilising data analytics will allow new perspectives and better decision making, which will mitigate bias in processes. There are already tools out there which help reduce bias, but these tools can have biases themselves in how they are programmed. Artificial, artificial intelligence and machine learning tools in 2019 will become smarter and tackle this problem by checking for biases within the algorithms themselves. 
The third message that, is, that re-emphasizes the first, where we measure the inclusion to get more diversity. Whilst in recent years we have placed the emphasis on capturing the data on diversity, the shift is moving to capturing the data of that of inclusion. Fourth, external partnerships and commitments. In the words of Amir, companies are starting to build affiliations with external organisations, such as Lean In or UN, He For She movement, or of course, ourselves at ENEI. Fifth, creating stronger and sustainable solutions. In simple terms, if the problems are structural, so should the solution. <coughs> Six, <coughs> inclusive brand and marketing and advertising campaigns. This has been brought about by quite a few companies that have learned the hard way when they launched campaigns that were not diverse or inclusive, and the media picked up on this, which in turn could have been damaging for the company's efforts and sometimes their own reputation. Seventh, increased effort on focus on race and ethnicity, but I would also like to add disability to that statement. The topic on gender balance will not and should never go away with the increasing demand of an inclusive culture. We will see more and more focus on other key areas of diversity, such as ethnicity and disability. But I think we will see further focus on many other protected and current protected and non-protected characteristics. Finally, in the UK, you saw the first gender pay cap reporting, which saw was a huge wake-up call for many businesses. However, this was the first step more countries and companies will start looking into pay gaps and they will feel pressure to report on and close the gap. In 2019, the discussions have evolved and started to look at disparity in pay between ethnic groups. We are moving towards more transparency and companies are in a state of readiness and prepared to act. I think we would all agree that at least eight of these, sorry, out of those eight trends, at least half of these trends have found their way into our inboxes and that we should do all that we can to shift the dial on global inclusion. At ENEI, we stand ready to offer organisations just like yours the support to find your way through the maze to becoming the most inclusive and intersectional organisations that you can be. Thank you for your time. <laughs>